Hi, in this lecture, we will be discussing about facility design and controls. So, facility design. So, understanding the risk prior to constructing or renovating a laboratory is vital to ensure the success of an effective bio-risk management program once work has commenced. But of course, this is a common sense because uh, before you actually do something, you need to properly plan what you're supposed to do. You need to have a robust design to avoid uh, mistakes bef uh, during and after construction. So, the design of the laboratory and the containment measures implemented can negatively impact a bio-risk management program. So, why is it a negative impact? Uh, this design decisions and selection of specific containment measures should be based on a comprehensive bio-risk assessment. So, basically, as the design, uh, as you are fleshing out the design, basically, the potential for changes are diminishing. So, you don't default, uh, when doing facility design, do not default to predefined solutions that may not be suitable in all cases. Of course, this, uh, the, the design must be properly tailored to your needs and to the objectives of your facility. So, infrastructure design and mitigation controls. Infrastructure and mitigation measures and controls must complement each other. So, your engineering control, this infrastructure, and uh, your procedures, your uh, SOPs. They should be uh, complementary to each other. They should um, make up for the lack of the other. So, what are some factors to consider prior to selecting mitigation measure? Actually, the design, uh, most, most, in most cases, the mitigation controls are, um, are designed from or rather after the infrastructure design. So basically, here you are actually looking at or trying to fill up the holes or the gaps left by the infrastructure. So of course, uh, are there any um, problems with the infrastructure? Are there any um, issues or gaps or holes in the in the layout of the building, in the facility, in the, in the infrastructure? Do you have utilities, reliable utilities, water, uh, gas? Uh, what else? Um, well, of course, even the uh, what waste disposal facility. And then, how do you have funds? So how much is the funds are used to purchase and maintain your equipment? And also, the personal training. The personnel must be properly trained and competent uh, to actually handle the work in the laboratory properly. And knowledge on international biosafety and biosecurity best practices. Also, the personnel... And the management must be aware, must be knowledgeable about the standards of biosafety and biosecurity and what are the best practices. Because, of course, uh, the best um, in biosafety and biosecurity is actually experience that is the best um, teacher with regards to this one. So you don't really understand much about biosafety and biosecurity unless you, uh, you experience it firsthand. Actually, most of the controls and the standards were developed based on previous accidents. Uh, let's, let's be honest, it's based from previous uh, outbreaks and accidents that were encountered. They, uh, they, want, they, they try to uh, get the source and then develop um, ways and procedures and standards to prevent those um, errors uh, from happening again. Even, for example, if that laboratory, let's say, um, if that laboratory was not following the standard procedure, uh, what should be, you should develop, or uh, the, the, the standards committee should develop a way for that laboratory to actually practice biosafety, or the standards of biosafety by, say, uh, doing frequent audits or um, giving um, punishments to, uh, to, to certain infringement of biosafety standards. So risk-based design decisions. In doing designs or uh, designing facilities, mostly uh, you do it uh, based on the risk that the lab is supposed to handle. So the risk-based design decisions relies on robust and detailed biosafety and biosecurity assessment. First, you need to assess what are the risks what are the hazards that will be handled by that facility or laboratory, and what could be the potential consequences of that. 
So, the bio-risk may stem from the nature of the agents or the toxins present in the facility. So, would that uh, facility be handling mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, agent? Would it be handling uh, HIV virus? Should it handle the COVID? or should it, uh, would it be uh, handling pathogenic or non-pathogenic agents? And then what are the procedures that are to be carried out? Are they for, um, say, animal testing? Because animal testing is, a, is different from in vitro testing. So you, you, there's a different set of standards and procedures and even facilities designed for that. So is, is it um, about um, testing it on host? Is it about in vitro testing or just going to study uh, the DNA, the, the genes of that agent and not the whole agent itself? The risk of exposure to the staff working in the facility. The risk to the environment or persons outside the facility. Is the facility located at the heart of the metro? at the heart of the city or is it on uh, on the suburbs is the suburbs um, a residential area are there any children or um, resident residences with children in that area etc and then is there a risk of theft of biological agents or toxin is your lab going to handle small packs which is a potential bioweapon so will there be any intent from outsiders uh, for um, basically uh, stealing your biological agent and then the risk to the facility and the users from outside threats uh, not only for um, basically uh, bioterrorists uh, from human threats but also uh, how uh, how is it um, is it vulnerable to fire earthquake etc so in the design process at the start you have the highest potential for positive impact because of course it's a blank page uh, a blank page has the highest potential. This is the pre-design and the programming. So you have the highest potential. You can change many things there. You can add many things there because uh, be well, you have a blank page. And of course, it's the lowest cost because you're just doing that brainstorming, doing that on paper, or even in, virtually in the computer. But once you do the schematic design, you develop the design, especially when you construct the actual um, facility and uh, construction documentation, of course, your potential for impact is going down. Potential for positive impact is going down because, again, uh, the more you put, um, it's like a blank paper. The more you put colors and um, drawings in your paper, like a blank canvas, so the more you put colors in, of course, the less number, uh, for example, uh, for a blank canvas, you can draw a seaside, you can draw a mountain view, you can draw abstract design there but the more that you put paint here of course it fleshes out it it won't become the abstract anymore it won't become a mountain view anymore it becomes uh the, the potential becomes narrower so you have uh decreasing potential for positive impact and of course increasing cost to implement change what if especially when you are doing the construction you just wanted to add last minute you add a certain room or facility for animal housing in your facility which during the pre-planning stage you were not considering that and so of course you need to make changes to overall facility and design and it might even um, compromise the safety the biosafety and biosecurity of the whole facility if, if it's not done correctly so basically you have a higher cost to implement change so what are the necessary information for designing the facility so the project goals, of course, the goals, the aspirations and requirements of your facility or the project that will be done in your facility, including, of course, a robust risk assessment. So the local or national codes, regulations, guidelines and standards to which the project will adhere. So not only we are going to adhere to the biosafety codes and standards, you need to also, uh, if, it's going, if you're going to build a new building, you need to adhere to the uh, building code to the um, fire safety code implemented in the local community and if it's if it's about a certain project for instance you are going to do a, a project in, in an already built facility of course you need to also assess does that facility um, adhere to the guidelines uh, required for that project for example you want to study uh, a, a level 3 uh, agent a risk level 3 agent so there must be a certain, uh, of course, there's an accompanying safety standards in handling that. So does, your, does the facility, uh, can the facility handle that um, risk, uh, risk level 3? 
or do you need to upgrade your facility? So, a functional space program. So, it lists all program spaces required in the facility. So, each facility has a, sp a certain space uh, which are allotted for a specific goal or uh, process. So, of course, you, you need to have a proper, uh, basically, that space allocation for each part of your facility. And then, organizational charts. So, it must illustrate the organizational structure of the group. Basically, it's about the human management system that will use and operate the facility. You need to have a proper hierarchy. The, uh, the overall director, for instance, the rec director of the, labor the building or facility, and then followed by, say, the managers of each uh, laboratory. For example, the manager of the biology, la biology laboratory, the manager for the chemical laboratory, the manager for, uh, for the computer laboratory, for instance. And then under those management, uh, what are the other um, personnel under those uh, managers. So you have uh, the group leader, the team leader, and then the, uh, the working staff, the rank and file members. So necessary information. So aside from those, you need to also have relationship diagrams that illustrate critical relationship between the spaces and the user groups. So um, not only the, uh, the hierarchy of the personnel, but also uh, this group is responsible for this particular space. For example, the biology labor laboratory. And another group is responsible for this uh, space, is the animal laboratory. And then another group for the chemical lab laboratory. And then we also have the chemical inventory or uh, the overall inventory of the lab. If you have, if we do not have a separate inventory for biological materials and chemicals, so you have an overall inventory. So who is under which? Are they uh, mutually exclusive and equal in ranking? So you need to have a proper uh, relationship diagram for that. So a listing of institutional space standards. So each space must have a, a proper um, SOP procedures for that. So what are, should be those procedures? Room diagrams and room data sheets recording as much information about each room type, each equipment and service needs as is available. So each laboratory, each room, each zone, uh, what are the equipments there, what are they for, what, should, uh, what can be and can't be done in each area. So, so these are some best practices for a laboratory design. So you need to have public-private separation. So basically, you need to allocate areas where public has free access and areas where the public has controlled or limited access and areas that are completely restricted. For example, if you have gone to the YGC uh, building, so the, the free access area is, of course, the, the outside area and the... Um, the entrance uh, lobby where the guard is stationed. So you have here uh, sofas and chairs there. So you can actually enter there. Um, but from there, the guard, of course, will ask you, who are you supposed to meet? Do you have um, proper access to these, uh, to certain facilities inside? So limited access, for example, the hallway and the lobby leading to each uh, laboratories. So um, basically, uh, some visitors, uh, for the facility can access that. And then some areas that are completely restricted, the actual biosafety laboratory, the actual containment zone, they can be completely restricted. They are completely private, only for personnel. So those are the um, uh, separation of the public and private. So you can use barriers, uh, security locks to uh, for those separation. And then zone strategies. So aside from uh, areas you designate as public or private, you need to separate or divide the spaces into certain zones, such as animal housing, the loading zone, the testing zone, conference and meeting areas for conference and meeting offices, even pantry. And how these zones are related to each other, which zones are connected. Basically, you need to look at... Um, the operational use also of these zones. For example, these are some zoning concept diagrams. So the first one we have here, this is uh, the lobby, followed by the general offices, and then this is the loading and support. So basically, uh, if you have the lobby and conference areas, these are usually uh, public or semi-public spaces, and then this, the loading and support areas are usually private spaces. So this, uh, we have a clear separation between them. And then, uh, let's say, for example, uh, containment laboratories. So, the containment laboratories is inside the general offices. So, it depends on um, basically how 
how you design or what the of course the risk in this case uh, the risk here is not so high because the containment laboratories are within the general offices which is um, usually of course office where people are, do not don PPE in general offices and then another one this one is for actually uh, personally prefer this one better so you have a containment laboratory separate uh, this is the loading and support areas so you you uh, basically when you say loading and support areas is uh, for the utilities for sample receiving etc and then you have the general offices here and then the lobby and conferences here so the semi-public spaces here you have a private because it's office area so generally private area and then strict restricted areas for um, basically biosafe so you have a clear zoning uh, delineation between them and of course you have a bridge between the loading and support zone with the containment laboratory zone and then another one a containment laboratory that can open to the general uh, the lobby and general uh, conference and offices you have the general offices as well here and the loading and support here so uh, basically these are some examples of uh, zoning concepts or how you actually arrange the zones in your facility so aside from that, flow analysis. Flow analysis address the movement of personnel and material in the facility. So basically, the zoning that we discussed a while ago, it's the basis uh, how you will uh, arrange its zone, which zone should be next to each other. So because uh, in the flow analysis, you are looking at, uh, for example, uh, the flow of movement of people and materials in the laboratory. So uh, analyzing the flow, you should be aware of, uh, for example, in uh, receiving the sample, from receiving the sample to actually uh, creating the final report for the study done on that sample. So there's a, uh, there's a flow there. So the sample is received, it will be run on the testing laboratory, or it will be stored in a facility for after some time. Uh, and then after running the, um, the, the sample, the test on the sample, uh, is it, should, be, uh, some, should it be stored or should it be um, disposed and then you run the reporting so you report uh, you do the report and then submit the report so of course there's a certain flow here so it runs from a zone where you load receiving area to the uh, laboratory area to the storage facility or even the waste management facility and then to the offices where you write the uh, reports and uh, etc so uh, basically you need to properly know how how it flows how the process flows how the humans the personnel involved move from one zone to another as they actually do the work or the the pro operating procedures and protocols in the laboratory so that um, knowing the proper flow of the uh, materials uh, of the uh, basically procedures in the laboratory, it ensures that all the necessary equipment and facilities are in the correct place. For example, in the receiving area, uh, there must be, uh, for example, a refrigerator there for um, samples received uh, that are uh, basically temperature sensitive samples. Uh, it must have a proper storage shelving. Uh, you should not place a biosafety cabinet, for example, in the storage area, in the receiving area. Uh, should uh, where should the autoclave be uh, situated, etc. So here is an example of the flow. So is the sample um, received and um, basically you do security check and then receive the sample and then should the sample be stored or should we go to uh, steri sterilization or it should be go uh, should it go to analysis laboratory and then from the analysis should it be stored or sterilized before disposing as waste. So basically, you need to need know what is the flow of the material and the personnel. So knowing the flow, you can actually design, properly design a facility that provides you with the best uh, basically way to actually handle these procedures without, um, basically it helps prevent contamination of other spaces. It also prevent, uh, it, it's also for ease of access. So, for example, uh, the autoclave is located at the back of the laboratory, but that autoclave is used for uh, as the first, um, uh, as the first in line, or as the always the first procedure for any uh, samples done in the laboratory. So, of course, you, your uh, contaminated sample will have to pass through the whole laboratory just to get to the autoclave at the end of the lab, 
And so, it can compromise the rest of the laboratory. So, basically, you need to place the autoclave at the, at the entrance area or near the entrance. So, something like that. So, actually, it depends on how, uh, on your protocols and the procedures your laboratory is designed to do. So, for example, here is um, a certain flow. For example, you have, uh, this is an animal cage. So, animal is a subject. So, the, uh, this is for animal testing. So, you sedate the animal in the cage. And then, once asleep, you move it. So, place on a cart. And um, you have your, uh, for for example, doing dissection. So, you, you, um, you place it on a chair. So, basically, you can see here a, a very clear, smooth flow of movement of personal and material so the subject is placed on a table a blood or tissue samples are taken so you package it of course the area where you do uh, the, the testing or retrieval of sample so you can you have a proper facility there for packaging and then uh, you can actually uh, have the uh, samples taken from procedure area for into the laboratory and then you can return your sample back to the cage so this is for an animal uh, testing facility where you get samples from animals so it depends on the laboratory of course how you uh, how the procedures are done so aside from that you need to uh, produce layers of protection in your facility so for example a secure freezer where you store um, sensitive materials and highly um, dangerous pathogens for example the small packs storage of the small facts so it must be in a secure freezer but aside from that you, you should not place a secure freezer in the hallway or in the lobby so that uh, you can brag to others oh we have here a secure freezer for small packs of course not you don't do that so you provide layers of protection from the secure freezer so the secure freezer must be located in a freezer room that's the first layer actually the first layer is the secure freezer itself then the second layer is the freezer room. Third layer, we have the lab zone. The freezer room is inside the laboratory area. And that area is inside a secure facility. And this is a secure site. So, for example, a fencing outside to prevent uh, outsiders, basically the general public, the pedestrian, from coming in the laboratory. And then you have the actual building with proper entrances and ex exits. And then um, you have uh, the lobby uh, basically, uh, secure entrances to the actual laboratory, secure entrances to particular areas in the laboratory, the containment areas in the laboratory, and even the storage areas in the laboratory. So, you provide layers of protection. So, uh, basically, placement of primary containment devices. So, where you should place your biosafety cabinets, your laminar hoods, even some equipments should be well-designed. Okay, so airflow and possible aerosols from the open face BSC should be considered because, of course, when you're using BSC, especially uh, biosafety cabinets 2, 1, and 2, uh, class 1 and 2, so you have, of course, there's an open air there. Although you have an air curtain that uh, provides protection, of course, it's an air curtain. It's um, when, of course, you just stick your, uh, your arms and hands inside the biosafety cabinets, you're actually disrupting the airflow so there might be a release of aerosols inside from inside the biosafety cabinet so you should consider that and of course airflow so your biosafety cabinet should be located in areas where uh, there's minimum traffic people don't always pass to and fro at your back and it must be far from the shared equipment and things of course in case of there's an out uh, there's a problem there's an escape from the bscs if it's in the public shared space all of the people using that shared space will be compromised so here is an example of a proper, of a good um, work zone. So here you have here the uh, entrance lobby. So you have the sink area here where people, of course, when you enter, you need to wash your hands first. So of course, placement. Again, uh, you consider here, one of the consideration is also the flow. The placement here of the, um, the sink ensures that your uh, bio uh, people as soon as they enter the laboratory they can wash their hands if you place a sink here they have to pass through the whole laboratory before being able to wash your hands so it's not a good idea and then we have here uh, bs is located in uh, areas where there's not much traffic so it's in the corner of the room or at the back end of the room and then the shared equipment is in a different zone from the biosafety cabinets as well as these work tables here and work benches so you have here uh, 
one example of placements of the biosafety cabinets. So other fact, uh, the facility design factors. So in doing and uh, designing a facility, these are some factors to consider. So sustainability. Sustainability is the ability to maintain a facility for the maximum amount of time using less energy without compromising safety and functionality. Especially here in the Philippines, we want to create a facility that can last long because, of course, the cost of um, the cost of renewing facilities is very high. In fact, um, even in the equipment, we if uh, the equipment breaks down, we tend to actually repair it rather than replace it. So the tendency is we want to uh, preserve the facility as ma as long as possible. And then adaptability and flexibility. Of course, especially in scientific laboratories where um, new equipment can be um, are being replaced. So for example, from a, uh, from a simple PCR device, it can be changed to a um, to a high throughput sequencer such something like that or in an RT-PCR so of course your um, your your facility if you want to la for it to last long it must be able to also adapt to to changes to progress in the scientific um, methodologies so adaptability versus flexibility a flexible space may be used for multiple purposes without significant changes whereas an adaptable space can be easily modified to suit a new Purpose. So your facility must be able to be flexible, where it can be used for multiple purposes. For example, a certain project was uh, this, this laboratory was built for a certain project. Once the project was uh, finished or completed, what should be done to this space? So that space can be converted to another uh, facility or to a similar facility, but um, tailored to a different project. And then it can also be. Ad adaptable so you can modify uh, you can add rooms is it conducible to add rooms additional rooms in your facility or is it conducible to uh, destroy this particular room so that it can join uh, to a lar uh, to another area to form a larger area so those are considerations for example here uh, this facility this is the same room so you have an animal holding facility here where and then a procedural analysis laboratory here and uh, once uh, you are done with rabbit testing, you want to do mouse facility. So here, you just simply change the um, the cages, the animal cages, to a different type of cages for mouse for mice, and then you have the same procedural laboratory. So here, it's actually a, a sink instead of a um, a bed for the animal bed. So you just change some. Uh, facilities but generally the general outline is the same for example you have the same sink here sink areas are the same you have here storage areas here so you just change the bed to a sink or um, a workbench for example and then what if you want to change it to a ship holding facility so a ship holding facility ship doesn't require um, basically it doesn't require your um, cages so it's actually a general pen so you install a pen area here and then you uh, install additional rooms for uh, as as needed by the procedural needed so you have uh, you add additional walls so this is adaptability so you adapt this area to a ship holding facility basically you break down walls you add additional walls and rooms to change your facility but general uh, outflow is similar same sink areas same uh, tables areas etc for flexibility you just change some things but the general layout is very similar so basically this is a space that is flexible and adaptable okay so other features that can be done so incorporate incorporation of features such as containment barriers HEPA filters and of course uh, directional airflow so in you, should, you could also include features that help promote compliance with established standard operating procedures. So, you, for example, uh, locating a sink near an exit where users need to wash their hands, providing ample spaces for storage to reduce lab clutter. Actually, uh, based on experience, that has been a, a problem. Uh, as you as experiments pile up, of course, uh, samples from previous experiments tend to pile up as well. So they should be proper storage devices. Or what should be done on the samples? Should it be um, should it be disposed of or should be st should it be stored? So you want to say, uh, you want to uh, minimize the clutter. 
providing enough space to promote the proper function of biosafety cabinets will facilitate and encourage users to also follow the proper procedures. So these are other design and feature suggestions. So by adding biosecurity features such as secure lock, secure storage freezers, and monitoring devices like CCTVs. So uh, the, 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 the hallway is monitored by a CCTV. Even the inside of the lab can be monitored by a CCTV. This is for biosecurity purposes as well. As for documentation, so in case of a breach or, or an accident, of course, uh, when you assess, when you look for the root cause of each accident, it's easier with a CCTV record. So these are some features. Actually, one of the best ways uh, that I can recommend to you when designing a laboratory is to look at other laboratories and what are they doing. So of course, it, I don't, I'm not saying that you should copy them per se, but you should get an idea on how you design your facility based on how they had designed them. Because if it's how they did it and it's working properly, that means that particular tactic or technique is good because it's properly working. So you should look at, basically you are looking at their experience in handling certain matters so that you have an idea. You implement that idea in your designing your own facility. So that's it for this lecture. So thank you for listening.